find the area between y equals x squared and y equals x. Now we've already done this one actually, it turns out, but I want to show you another way of doing the same problem. And the way that I'm going to show you is somewhat of a curiosity with this one, and you can do it either the way we've already done it or this new way, but there will be some functions you'll run into where we need to use this approach. If you think back to when we started doing integrals, we looked at an area and we decided to split it into these small vertical rectangles with a width of delta x and the height based on the function. But we can also do something different. We can also separate it into small horizontal rectangles. And we can use those horizontal rectangles to fill up this area. If we do that, the thickness of this rectangle, instead of being delta x, is now delta y. Because delta just means a small difference or a small change in two things. And so if we're looking at a horizontal rectangle, the width is a small change in elevation. That thickness is now a delta y. Now if you think ahead to what that's going to mean, when we start doing our integral, that means we're going to have dy in the integral. So our integral is going to be something dy. And why is that significant? The fact that there's a dy there, geometrically it tells us that we're doing these horizontal rectangles. It means that we're splitting things and dividing them into small changes in y. But when it comes to actually doing calculations, it means that whatever functions we put here, they need to be written as functions of y instead of functions of x. In other words, we need to turn things around so that instead of having y equals a function of x, <clears throat> we need x equals some function of y for each of them. Which is fairly straightforward once you know what you're doing. It's just a matter of flipping things around algebraically. So that's the key when we start turning the problem sideways and we do horizontal rectangles, we just need to rewrite our functions as functions of y. Now one of these is really easy. If y equals x, solving for x just says x equals y. So that's no big deal at all. The other one, we just have to do one step. If we want to solve for x, we take the square root of both sides. So we get x equals the square root of y. Now we should pause here and point out that there's a little bit of a quirk here. When we have y equals x squared and we solve for x, really x should equal plus or minus the square root of y. But when we're looking at the picture that we've drawn, see if you can figure out what the positive and negative square roots of y are. The positive square root of y is going to be where x is positive, meaning this right side of the parabola. The negative square root of y is where x is negative, that's this left side of the parabola. So the part that we're interested in, in the range that there's an area bounded between these two functions, we're looking at the right half of the parabola. So we're looking at the positive square root. This over here is the negative square root of y. So that's why here I've just written x equals the square root of y. It's not that we're leaving something off or ignoring something, but very carefully we've chosen to use the positive one because that's the one that applies to our picture, to the range we're interested in. So that's really the tricky part with all of this. Once we get to that point, once we recognize how to write those two functions as functions of y, the same principle applies as before. We need limits of integration, and we need to subtract the upper function minus the lower function. But again, instead of using the term upper and lower here, because we're not talking about upper and lower, we're talking about larger and smaller. So when our functions are oriented vertically, we've got a box like this for our uh, element of our integral, then the larger one is above the other one. But when we're drawing things horizontally, now the larger function is the one that's further to the right, and the smaller function is the one that's further to the left. So really when we say upper and lower, we really mean further away from zero and closer to zero. So earlier we were doing examples where we had 
the zero was the x-axis, and so further from the x-axis and closer to the x-axis. In this case, we're looking at the one that's further from the y-axis, which would be the parabola, and the one that's closer to it, which would be the straight line. So in this case, the upper function, quote unquote, would be the square root of y, and the lower function, quote unquote, would be y, because it's closer to zero. Once we recognize that, that's what goes inside our integral, and then we just need limits of integration. So again, we need to figure out the y values now, because we're doing an integral with respect to y, so these limits of integration are going to be y values. So we need the y values where these two cross. We've already done the work to figure out the x values where they cross, where x is 0 and x is 1, and because one of our functions is just the line y equals x, it turns out those are the same as the y values. But if not, we could work it out the same way as before. We would set the two functions equal to each other and solve. We could either do it in terms of x and then plug those in to find the y values, or we could set up, once we have these functions of y, we could set those equal to each other and solve. Either way you do it works just fine, but we've got our limits of integration now, which happen to be the same ones as before. That's the hard work. The hard work is setting up the integral, interpreting the problem, interpreting the picture to derive this area set up. But once we have that, the actual integral is pretty straightforward. To integrate the square root of y, you can think of it as y to the 1 half, which turns into 2 thirds y to the 3 halves when you integrate. And when you integrate y, you get 1 half y squared. We can then plug in the limits of integration from 0 to 1. Plugging in 1 gives you 2 thirds minus 1 half, and plugging in 0 gives you 0 minus 0. So it all works out to 1 sixth, which of course is the same value we got earlier for the area. The area hasn't changed, we just approached it a different way. So there are some problems, many in fact, that you can do either way. You can either write it as an integral with dx by thinking of those vertical rectangles and thinking of your functions as functions of x, your limits as limits on x. Or you can write it in terms of y using those horizontal rectangles where you think of functions of y, limits in terms of y, and everything is kind of turned sideways. There are also some problems that we'll, you'll see that are set up as functions of y, and so it really makes sense to start with this naturally. There are also cases where it may be more convenient to use one or the other, but you can use your judgment on that. But certainly you should be comfortable with both methods and be able to switch back and forth between the vertical and horizontal pictures.